Hi, I'm DJ Six Smith. You're watching The Sit Down. Wilson Cruz here with us. Brand new docuseries Visible out on television. What's up, man? Nice to meet How you. How are you? Good to Thanks have you here. Me. So we're here in New York. Brooklyn guy, New York yeah. guy. Why don't we wind it all the way back first? Tell me about growing up in New York. What are some of your favorite memories? Well, I split my time between New York and L.A. So I was already, my family moved to California. I shouldn't say L.A. It was California by the time I was in my teens. But we, my parents grew up here in Brooklyn, in Greenpoint. I was born in Brooklyn Hospital. We were in Queens when I was in, until first, second grade. First, second grade. Um, and then we moved uh, to Michigan, of oh, all wow. places. But I have literally split my entire life between California and New York. So, um, you know, as an adult, I, I've, I've split my entire adulthood between California and New York. And now Brooklyn? Actually, I'm spending this, the, the rest of this year between California and New York. Yeah, what's it like balancing that? Um, I, don't, you, I don't actually have a home anywhere right now. Which so. is such a weird thing, which is like not uncommon for people no. in the business. I'm basically homeless again, <laughs> in a different way. You're like, cool, thanks uh, guys. Yeah. Uh, no, so when I'm doing Star Trek in Toronto, I live in Toronto, those seven to eight months. Yes, it takes that long. Yeah, and, it's a beast um, of a project. It's a beast. And we just finished up, and then uh, the hiatus is usually about six months, so I'll spend three months in L.A., and then I'll spend three months in New York, unless some other project takes me elsewhere. But, you know, I'm single. I don't have a dog. I don't even have a yogurt <laughs> in the refrigerator. There's no plant that I need You're to good. take care of. Yeah. I'm like, just, I'm going to go where I need to go. Just roll it out and see what happens, right? Yeah. It's working so far. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to do it. Yeah, you know what, but for right now in your life, it's a good chapter. For now, yes. Well, speaking of different chapters, this project kind of mm. opens you up to a whole different world and stuff that is kind of similar and different. So what was the most fascinating part to you about this whole thing? <sighs> I think what, what, the, what I loved about the experience was that we gave these people who risked everything, um, some of them their lives and their livelihoods, an opportunity to tell us what that experience was and why they were willing to go there. Um, for me, you know, I knew on a personal level the costs, mm -hmm. right, and the demands of um, being first, right, of what responsibility comes with that. And I knew that there were other people who shared those responsibilities within their own communities. So I think of like Candace Kane, who played mm -hmm. the first trans regular character on TV, or Laverne Cox on Orange is the New Black, or Janet Mock, and um, Billy Porter, uh, Ellen DeGeneres. These people who l took a leap of faith, and, um, and they did it not just for themselves, but for an entire community. And I wanted to hear from them uh, firsthand what that meant to them. And you, in the end, get to see these very vulnerable conversations, these vulnerable interviews from people who really opened up for us. Um, but, you know, the, the most fascinating part was learning about the times before, totally. you know, that, yeah. that I didn't live through, but that generations before me have that paved the way for me. Um, learning about the Army McCarthy hearings and the fact that the first time the word homosexual was actually used on TV was during those hearings. It's crazy. It's yeah. nuts. It's insane. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty uh, savvy history buff, and when you look at our history books, when they teach the Army McCarthy hearings in school, they never mention the, the Lavender Scare. They talk about the Red Scare, they don't talk about the Lavender Scare. Um, and I think that's an important part of our history. You know, what we did to people's lives um, at that point is pretty devastating. Mm. Um, and it's a part of our history and we need to, we need to learn it. Um, but you know, then, I, then y in that same episode, you talk to somebody like Tim Gunn. Mm -hmm. We thought we were gonna get colorful you know, <laughs> repartee it from was Tim Gunn, and he that. came and just laid it out. He it was, was like, like a therapy like, session. Yeah, he let his guard for completely him too. Down. Yeah. And it was heartbreaking. You know, we hear about what it was like, right, mm -hmm. for people, um, and we can imagine. But to hear firsthand of the physical and emotional abuse that he suffered under his father, mm -hmm. um, the fact that they sent him to conver conversion therapy and, and psychiatry and just because he was playing with dolls, right? It's Let the boy insane. play with the doll. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that was the most, that, that, for me that was the most fascinating. And, and hearing someone like Ellen DeGeneres, who mm -hmm. we've, we've heard her story for many years, some of us lived through right. it, but I don't think any of us really understood the toll it took. Um, the sacrifices she made, everything she lost and had to rebuild um, in order to be who she is today. So, um, 
yeah, those were the most fascinating parts for me. When you rewatch that scene with Ellen, you can tell that she's a little hesitant to even say the line. She knows it's coming. I know. And I've seen it now a few times, and I'm like, oh my gosh, she realizes how much of it is about to change. It's so, about to change. Yeah. yeah. So what were some other little interesting rewatches, whether it was that scene or some other previous television scenes where you're like, I didn't realize this in the moment fully, but now I get it. Hmm. Because, like, the Norman Lear stuff, to me, was really interesting. Right. right? You know, I think... You know what's interesting about that, for me, mm -hmm. is how Norman Lear talks about Edith. Yeah. That they were very mindful that they treated Edith as, uh, when they were writing Edith, they would write her as, what would Jesus do? Mm. And that Jesus would <laughs> weep over the way we treated, or we still treat in many ways, uh, LGBTQ people, um, especially at that time. and. For them to put the, the most beloved character, to have Norman Lear put his most beloved character in the position to be feeling such empathy and sympathy for this character. He was the first person to write LGBTQ characters from a sympathetic point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and that changed everything. Um, so yeah, I think about that. I think about Mark Siegel, who's an activist, yeah. who, you know, right here at the Tiffany Network. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the surprise, you know, he, showed up on Walter Cronkite's um, evening news um, to start a dialogue, right? People are like, why would, you, why would you disrupt an evening news? Well, after he did that, after he just sh popped up on Walter Cronkite, people had, were, had to talk about what happened, and mm -hmm. they had to talk about why he would do that, which was to bring attention to a community that was completely invisible and ignored, and say, you are ignoring us on your network. We are part of this culture. Mm -hmm. we are, our lives are, should be part of your broadcast, and you're ignoring us. Um, and he was forcing them to, to take notice. Um, so stuff like that, I think, when I see that now, it, um, it fills me with pride, right? Mm -hmm. and, a, and a sense of gratitude, because they did that for me. Right. I wasn't even alive yet. Yeah, you just, weren't even, I definitely your mom wasn't may alive. not even be alive. <laughs> <laughs> My parents were alive. I definitely wasn't alive. But it's really fascinating for me because, like, for example, Asia Kate Dillon, they were here. And that is just a transcendent character. And to be able to see that now yeah. and also see what everything else has happened, like, it's really cool. But and to hear them talk about, um, you know, for me, like, when I read the character description for Ricky Vasquez, mm -hmm. I was like, you know, they said he was like, 15-year-old, androgynous, like amb ambiguous like Jodie Foster and uh, Alice Doesn't Live Here mm -hmm. Anymore, which was like a movie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, when they looked at that, their, the character description for Billions, mm -hmm. it helped them understand who they were. Right. They had never seen a, what non-binary was. That was a new term for them. And so in many ways, it, it, it paralleled my experience that Ricky helped me um, identify myself and helped me through a, a, a really difficult time with my father. They helped, that show helped define them for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to hear from them what that experience was like and what it did for them personally. Mm -hmm. um, and we got to talk about that on, on the series. So, yeah. And I love that people are, you know, there's this one story that, that they tell about how Someone says, well, I came out to my family as non-binary, and the grandmother was like, oh, so you're just like that character on Billions. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, that's the power that's of That's why we need TV, and the same thing with Lena Waithe. Uh, yes. I, I remember watching that and being like, Master of None, they get it. This is so important because yes. it's going to help a whole generation of black kids and white kids and brown kids to understand how difficult it is to yeah. come out in a community and a culture that doesn't that necessarily That relationship accept. between Lena and Angela. Yeah. I mean, I know those women. Right. Like, I know Amazing that relationship. It was so real. It was so honest. Um, and because it was so specific, it was universal. Mm -hmm. Right? Anybody can watch that and understand the, the parent-child relationship and the fear of disappointing them. So um, it's powerful. So then, you know, she says, you know, she didn't know that she was the revolution she was waiting for. Yeah, that was and a she, profound that was. I mean, when she said that, I was like, can we just... <laughs> <laughs> Put it in now. <laughs> well, that's why you were telling me off camera this is really for the young people and the generation yeah. that didn't grow up with this. And you mentioned the difficulty with family. Like, what are some things you talk about in terms of advice to people in dealing with this stuff? Because family members don't understand a lot of things when people yeah. start to make change. Sexuality is really at the top of that list. I mean, listen, I, I find it hard to advise anybody about their sp specific family dynamic. But um, I think when you see these 
stories played out on TV, I think the power that they have is they can prepare your family uh, for the conversation you're about to have them. I think pe families are more capable and ready for the conversation now because of the stories that they watch on TV than, let's say, Tim Gunn mm -hmm. had yeah. in his time. So these stories are, are important. They're the, they're the way that we not only entertain ourselves, but they inform what our culture is now. And when you're not part of the conversation, you don't feel like you're important. Um, Oprah says yeah. in our documentary, uh, you know, when you don't see yourself on screen, it's saying that you don't matter, that your life doesn't matter. So um, we matter, our lives are yeah. important, and these stories help us feel a, a, a better part, a bigger part of, of, of the culture. And they help us reveal ourselves mm -hmm. to the people we love. Yeah, and it really is not an exaggeration to say it does come down to a matter of life and death for a lot of different people in this situation. Yeah. And it's really fascinating because I think about where you were in your life with my so-called life to where you are now with Star Trek and just what identity looks like on television. What's it been like for you with this journey just doing movies and TV and plays and all that? It hasn't been easy, yeah. I'll tell you that. Tell me um, some of the challenges because I, get, well, I think it's important to talk about. You that. know, for so long, you know, I, I, I don't know if in the beginning that people in this industry knew what they were going to do with me. Right. Like I think for, I think it's a safe bet to say that most people would have thought, oh, you know, that was a lovely opportunity for that young man. Good luck, mm -hmm. right? And as I'll opposed to like, what's the next thing? Yeah, for Wilson, right? you know, because there wasn't a whole lot. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened was, which was fascinating, was I think there was a hunger. There was a, um, there were people who wanted to tell these stories, but there weren't really, there wasn't really anybody who was willing to take them on. You know, we talk about um, uh, uh, some of the, the early TV movies um, that there were scripts out there for, but there were actors who wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Um, there's a movie called That Certain Summer, and they went out to, you know, all of these huge TV stars at the time, and what's his name who played Columbo, I think it was, who said, um, uh, I'd rather play Hitler mm. than to play a gay man. Wow. Um, but Hal Holbrook, stepped up. Um, for me, it was, uh, my experience was, oh, here's this young man who's willing to play this, these parts. And so I got every high school, you know, gay teenager script right, that there was. Immediately. And yeah. meanwhile, I was 19, mm -hmm. so I couldn't play those all the time. <laughs> um, so for me, it was about, I, I, it was a concerted effort to show people what I could do. Mm -hmm. So I went, and did some ind independent film that that helped some independent films that helped m change the way people saw me. But I also went back to the theater and I I, I went on my, the next big job I did was Rent on Broadway, and um, and so that that was a clue for people to say, oh, you know, this isn't a one hit wonder. This is a guy who comes to us with some ability. Um, and then it was just about knocking down doors, mm -hmm. right? Like insisting that I be seen for certain things. Um, my biggest challenge for a long time was convincing uh, casting directors and content creators that um, certain roles didn't have to be white. Hmm. You know, it's like yeah, why can't it we was just the, change this a little bit? It was the default, bit. right? Yeah. Like you, p they would, p these writers would write these characters, and that's who they'd have in their minds. And my job was to go in there and go, it doesn't necessarily need to be the case. Like, mm -hmm. what about this? You know? Um, Did you ever change anybody's view? And something like oh, that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, can you give me a couple For of For sure. Like, well, my first job, the job I got before my so-called life, actually, where I got my union card, was a role that was written for three white choir boys. Hmm. And I insisted on being seen by the casting director, Sally Steiner, at the time. And um, I think she liked how ballsy I was about <laughs> it, or insistent, This is as a kid you're doing annoying. this, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh... And she, you know, she she let me audition, and then she let me, you know, audition for producers, and I ended up getting the job. And because I got that job, I was able to audition for my so-called life the next year, which was a series regular role because wow. I was part of the union. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's about being your own champion, mm -hmm. about not taking no for an answer. When you are part of marginalized communities, and especially if you're part of more than one marginalized community. Um, if you want to get anything done in this town, you're going to have to make it happen for yourself. Another interesting with a smile. Sure. 
You know, another <laughs> interesting example is Party of Five. Ah. What it was and what it now is, because without all the work that's been done the last 20 years, the new version of Party of Five doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, when I was on Party of Five, <laughs> yep. uh, back in the day, I was the only Latino yep. on that show, right? Like on the last season, um, and uh, there was a whole storyline about you know my my daughter and, uh, but now to see that this new show has come up, which is I feel is even more timely and more no doubt prescient yeah. than than it was then. So. Um, I think it's interesting that we're taking a look at these older television shows and revamping them for a new audience, and that that means looking at who we cast mm -hmm. and what what um, how we can diversify those those stories. Yeah. We should have been doing that then. Yeah, and I'm just and, saying. and who we are today as a society. Right. Yeah. So, what are the big things you want people to think about when they watch this whole docu series here? Um, you know, the times we live in are are. Um, anxiety inducing for mm -hmm. a lot of people if you are a part of a marginalized community and I hope people watch this and understand that we've been through a lot we've already as a community endured and been resilient in the face of pretty terrible circumstances um, and I hope people can watch this and go oh we've survived that now it's my time to step up and make the kind of change that's necessary now. Who do I step up for? Um, how do I want to push uh, the envelope and, and make sure that more people are represented on our, on our screens, um, that our, all of our stories are valuable? So, um, you know, I believe my life motto has always been that I, I, we are all here mm -hmm. to inspire each other to do better. And I'm inspired by the people who paved the way for me, and I hope that I'm paving the way for those who come after me, but then that's not where it stops. They have to continue to do the work once I'm done, which could be tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great work. Really nice to meet you. Thank Thanks you. so much. Why don't you tell everybody where they can check out the great work here? Please watch Visible out on television, which is available now on Apple TV+. There you go. That's Wilson. I'm DJ. See you next time here on The Sit Down.